a little over, but uh, not too far over, I promise. Or we'll just talk really fast. Or we'll talk fast. Awesome. I know we're in the way of cocktails, so let's be reasonable. So you hear that? Yeah, exactly right. <laughs> um, so guys, uh, thank you for being here. Thank you both for being here. Um, so um, I guess we'll just cut right to the chase. After you, please, first, uh, tell us a little bit about uh, your 2018, for both of you, uh, the year in marketing for, for Kia, and then for, uh, for Nissan as well. So please go ahead, Kimberly. Um, all right, in two seconds or less, because the human attention span is about, actually, I think it's 5.8 or 6 seconds right now. So, I'm yeah. <laughs> um, 2018's been a really fascinating year for us. Um, just to put it in a nutshell, it's called the Stinger. Um, it's a performance car that we launched um, earlier this year that really, I think, has changed the conversation about our brand, um, about who we are. We're the youngest mainstream brand in the U.S. Um, and the new car that we launched, again, called the Stinger, was, I think, a really great way to communicate through lots and lots of media. We had a massive media effort behind that car. Um, and I think that really teed off the, the rest of the year for us, which is really about getting people to reevaluate Kia as a brand and who we are. And we can talk more about that later. Okay. Eric? Uh, 2018 for us has been about a, a number of new car launches, the Nissan Leaf, the Nissan Kicks, um, which we had a lot of fun with, and the Nissan Altima. But at the same time, um, uh, refocusing on California is an opportunity market. Um, and uh, really just trying to, to better balance uh, retail and brand messaging. Okay, okay, cool. So before we get into the meat of this conversation, I just want to um, uh, talk, uh, uh, get these guys to talk a little bit about like, what their specific um, responsibilities are. Um, so Kimberly, uh, you oversee the customer journey sort of strategy and implementation for Kia, right? Um, which we know is typically quite long um, for uh, both customer and brand. Um, so how, how is it that you read the tea leaves? Um, how do you know where to focus most and when? And how do you know where to increase, decrease spend? And when it's time to pivot? How do you do your job? <laughs> Am I in writing a seconds. book now or what? <laughs> hey, in 5.6 seconds right. and falling. Nice. Remember that. Um, I mean, Everybody out of the clock. it's one of the hardest questions that we, we're trying to ask ourselves right now. And I'm sure that um, it's the same thing for Eric that... Um, audiences are changing. Our audience is really changing quite a lot. We're trying to, I think, as, as other brands are, you know, reach out to more millennials. Their attention span is even shorter than the average um, person, I believe. Um, and so it's a real dance between, you know, how do we look at all the different touch points that we've used in the past, some of which still work for a, a very broad audience that I think we attract all the way up till. I was just in a focus group with a Forte um, uh, launch, uh, one of our new owners, who I believe is probably about 78 or 80 years old. Um, usually we try to skew a little bit younger, but it was fascinating to hear somebody that old saying, you know, I love my new Forte, I think it's awesome, and we asked him, how did you hear about it? And he said, I just saw one on the street. So talk about location. Hey, man, um, how crazy. You know, you just don't know what somebody's <laughs> going to say, and, and they love their car because it's easy for both of them to get in and out of it. So, you know, it's just kind of fascinating to see that. So I don't know about reading the tea leaves or, or predicting the future or, you know, what we can do next in terms of having that definitive answer of, you know, who should we be talking to? What media exactly will they be following? What's the right way to, you know, divvy up the, the funds that we have? The best we can do is really try to understand, you know, for the, for the cars that we have that are coming up, who is that new audience and what are some ways that we can reach them that they may not expect, at least for us. Because things like programmatic, really important, social media, really important, all of that. But we're asking people to reevaluate Kia. So it's a little bit of a different proposition than probably Nissan, where people really know the brand well, they're familiar with it. Not a lot of people know who we are, so just a quick brief message in a moment of digital may not be enough to change people's minds. Okay. Um, so predictive or reactive mostly, what you do? <laughs> uh, it's a fine balance between both. I think we're very much planted in the short term very, right now, trying to make sure that we keep our turf. But at the same time, we're trying to figure out what's that right mix for next year, and we're just finalizing our budget for next year right now, as I'm sure you are as, as well. Okay. Um, and a lot of things are gonna be, if from a moving attention span standpoint, um, how do we couple different media outlets together mm -hmm. to come up with something that I think is gonna be more interesting, so. Which we're gonna Ross, get to I know shortly. that question was for Kim Kimberly, but I'll just say, same sort of thing. It's, uh, yeah. we constantly talk about the need to stay the course, work our plan, have a plan, um, but stay nimble. You have to keep learning, you have to keep understanding what's going on, market dynamics, what's going on competitively. And it's really, I hate to overuse the word, but it's finding that balance. Um, having a plan, especially at tier one, having a brand uh, presence, having a brand plan at tier one, and then staying as nimble as you can so you can react to opportunities uh, at tier two. Right, and the message is important too, right? So I, I, as I understand it, your message is important for, for your your particular Oversight, that's, right? That, so that's content my sp specific, yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, so uh, we're talking about um, content. We're talking about um, sponsor partnerships. You do several, several, several. Can I say it? Several of those. 
Um, so here I'm thinking specifically when I talk about um, you know the event market, uh, sorry, the sponsor marketing that you guys have done, uh, the the real hit that you guys have with Titan and Heisman, right? We're, um, we're doing why Heisman? Yep. Why Heisman? And uh, uh, well, why? so so really, um, yes, I know we're bigger than Kia, but we're still not as big as the the. the, the the really big guys, as we all know, you know, Ford, Chevy, Toyota, in, in terms of spend and in terms of presence. And so we've been looking more and more lately at partnerships. How can we make one plus one equal three? Um, can we work with, you know, and we've done s some things the last couple of years with uh, Disney and Star Wars. Um, Heisman, how can we connect with uh, really passionate football uh, audiences in a way that, that is meaningful and not just, just more noise. And certainly um, being the premier partner of the Heisman Trophy, the, probably the most recognizable sports trophy in America, mm. you know, that's a way for us to hopefully, again, Heisman plus Nissan, if we do it right, in, in a way that's not intrusive but actually adds value, um, how could, that's how we can make, uh, cliche, one plus one equal three. Um, we've recently, with the Titan, um, with our Calling All Titans campaign, we partnered with Habitat for Humanity, Red Cross, um, and the national parks. And uh, again, some long-term partnerships that we've just established that we plan to do for quite some time. Uh, again, can we help them? Can they help us? Can we somehow make one plus one equal more than that? Right. So that's, that's what we're thinking about and that's what we're trying to pursue with Titan specifically. And uh, uh, again, that's how we're reaching a college football audience Heisman, that's the way in. Um, Got did it. that answer? It cool. felt no, yeah, like it, it does. did. No, no, uh, right. uh, no. We, we we touched on this a little earlier in the day. I don't know if you, you guys. I don't think we're here, but um, we did talk a little bit about sponsor marketing before, and um, it's it's incredibly important. It will remain so, right? And it's all part of the journey. So um, uh, moving along, because we're you know you guys are all five five point six seconds or less. What specific or unique challenges are you finding in reaching your targets? And now we're talking about millennials and Gen Z, and we had that terrific Gen Z presentation earlier. Um, like, do you feel like your brand is caught up to the present reality of millennials, for example? And what are you thinking about as Gen Z enters the work the workplace? And remember, they're identity shifters. Are they similar, different, et cetera, and right. so forth? Both I, of you. I yeah. mean, again, that's a million dollar question. Um, and some of our cars will highlights. appeal to people that are literally just getting their driver's license all the way up until they are in their 80s and maybe beyond. Um, and so when it comes to, you know, how do we how do we find that niche and that sweet spot? You know, there's only so much budget to go around. We're launching a couple new cars next year. Some will appeal to a very young audience and, and some millennials definitely, especially with families. Um, and then, you know, we're looking at people that are going to be in their 60s and 70s. So the hardest part is, you know, with a limited amount of money to spend, we want to be relevant to all of those folks. And do we pick an audience that's more like a Gen X and a, and a millennial just because it's kind of a sweet spot, um, especially for the two cars I'm thinking of? Um, and the answer is, you know, we're, we're always going to try to, to hit that um, in the middle, right? We're going to try to figure out content, messaging, sponsorships, things like that that are going to resonate there. But if we keep doing that, then we do lose the opportunity to really speak uniquely to millennials and even older buyers sometimes. So I think it's a, it's a bit of a dance, like you said, it's a balance to try to figure out how to do both at the same time. What we find from millennials is, and I'm sure that many of the millennials in this room, as well as some Gen Z folks potentially, um, talk about being tuned out to most mainstream media. Um, talk about tuned out to cars in general. Um, we were just speaking a couple days ago on the phone about, um, I doing some guest lecturing at different local universities because I love, love teaching. Um, and it's a fascinating way to do a bit of research. And so I was talking to about 30 or so um, uh, college seniors, their marketing uh, degrees that they were about to get. And I asked them the question, so how many of you have bought a car recently? Or at least a car or you have a car? You know, a few raised their hands. How many of you love the experience the entire time? Hands all went down, right? How would you describe it? Give me some words, guys. Tell me what you thought. Painful, Painful hassle, don't want to do that again. Isn't that that car called like Car Carvana or something? Aren't they coming out? Can't we buy through them or some other way? And afterwards, people ask me questions like, "How do I actually really buy a car without going to a dealership?" <laughs> um, <laughs> and so, me. you know, sure. me asking them, "So, what mediums are you interested in? You know, are you looking at television?" And the answer is, "What are you talking about? I'm a student. I have no time for that. Um, that's kind of a moot point." But it was interesting because they, the, ra the, the range of where they hear about things. Obviously, there's a lot of word of mouth. It's a college community. You're going to find a lot of messaging being spread, you know, amongst others. Hey, I got this new thing. That's really cool. Um, but even things, and I know we're going to talk about this maybe later, but even things like out-of-home messaging when they're driving, they, they can, their attention can be caught almost from anywhere, at any time, at any place. And so what they were saying is, you know, don't try to tell me everything all at once. Just try to tell me one thing. Because quite frankly, I really don't care about everything else. 
And, and so how do we do that, plus tell you about our features and our benefits and our cars and all the traditional things that we like to tell people, when really, it's like they don't want to hear all of that, especially should, millennials and Gen Z. They're, they're hyper-connected, and uh, while that's, that's great in many ways, because you can reach them in many ways, it's also uh, quite a challenge to keep them uh, interested beyond yeah. 5.6 seconds. And, uh, yeah. I know. Tell me. So <laughs> like, yeah, here we go. <laughs> so this uh, this was all going somewhere, right? I've, and we've arrived at that moment. Um, so what is the one constant that we have as marketers to, uh, to to use as like a baseline from which we can kind of view the consumer, right? We have a couple of them actually, but one. Uh, well, we're gonna title of the panel. Uh, location is the yes. Media. We know the location. It's okay. very important, right? Mm -hmm. um, so our theme here is is how location, right? And data are changing the customer journey. Um, obviously, consumer location is this known quantity these days. Um, but um, I guess, um, you know, we had a really interesting presentation earlier, and I don't usually talk about it like, you know, our, our sponsor presentations, but I actually believe, I totally believe that location is incredibly important and that it's, it's, a, it's, it's, a, it's a new world when the locations can talk back to the mobile devices that we all have in our pockets. And that, um, so for example, we heard from you know, the, the presentation about out of home, when locations communicate with mobile devices, uh, it opens up some new possibilities, right? Data targeting, uh, mobile devices, uh, I'm sorry, relevancy. Um, but so how do you guys currently use these sort of non-traditional media, I guess we'll call it, um, and how do you see this evolving in terms of how they can communicate with the other media that we all have I'm to work with? The, to the media. <laughs> yeah. The expert. Um, I, I mean, I think one of the hardest things that um, we're trying to figure out right now, in addition to everything else we just talked about, is um, planning for something like a car launch. You want to make sure, obviously, you cover all your bases, right? Digital, social, you know, out of home, uh, television, YouTube, you know, you name it. It's all over the place. But I think that the, the tricky part for us is that so many of those ideas come in different uh, pockets, right? So we'll get pitched by um, you know, the broadcast networks about you know, upfront and that kind of thing. We'll get pitched by Google to increase our search and Facebook to do more social and many of you in the room to do different parts of that you know, picture. But the consumer only sees one thing, right? They see like one message and it might be you know, uh, New York Times Square. They see something out of door. Oh, that's really cool. What is that? And they expect us as brands to make sure that every other touch point that they look up search, find, um, that finds them, notifications, whatever that might be, or they look in social media, that it's all one voice talking to them. So, if, and what we especially find as a challenger brand is if people have to work too hard to find something or to get to that next step, mm -hmm. like forget it. Mm -hmm. It's just not, it's not gonna happen. You know, you have so many great choices. Obviously, you know, yep. Nissan, Toyota, Ford, Chevy, we've talked about these other brands. Key is one of those, hey, we, we might be something you might want to look at just in case you're interested. We have great product and we know that we're basically asking you a favor. That's how I tell my team. All right, you're asking people for a favor to interrupt them and say, I just need a second of your time. Can you consider us and just look at us while you're looking at everything else at the same time? So if I have to search for something and our, and our mobile page takes you know, six seconds to load, forget it. Again, your attention span is gone. You've moved on to the next thing. And it's like, well, if you really wanted my attention, then you would have tried to at least keep it and try to make things that are more holistic and a more 360. So what I struggle with sometimes is we get a lot of great ideas from media companies about how we can help you find that audience. It's contextually relevant. You can do digital integrations. That's all fabulous. But you're looking at it from your own lens, your own vertical, which is what you're supposed to do. But it would be even more helpful to figure out, now how does that play off of other things that we're going to be doing, other medium that we're going to be um, you know, uh, investing in and looking at? Because the consumer sees it that way. They don't see it as, oh, that was that one-off that we did in Times Square. That was just kind of that cool little thing. And by the way, that's got nothing to do with the experiential event that we're hosting next month for you. That's on a different topic. What are you talking about? So yeah, but I think the question is, is can it, you know, if, if, if you're talking about, like, you, you know, we saw a Times Square takeover earlier, and, like, you know, c can you pair these things together? I mean, you know, if, if uh, you know, I, I don't know, seamless connectivity and all that stuff is really important, and it makes it, it, makes it all possible in a way, doesn't it? Yeah. To, to, to sort of build, to build off of that and use location as, like, a, you know, and where the consumers are and the mobility of it right. as a kind of grounding Yes, you know, we should know who you are, we know where you are, yeah. and we should make it easier. All I'm saying is it's other pieces. Yeah, it's not just pay attention to me and do something for us and go buy a car. I would love that, I'm sure you would too, but there's more to it than just that one moment in time. It's folks, helping them. Folks are consuming data, where their information, messaging, mm -hmm. when they want, where they want, how they want. Um, we need to know, from a location standpoint, we need to know as much as we know about them, as much as we can about them. Um, data is king. Uh, the entity that has the data is going to win, and location is an extremely important and a growing with 
cell phones, obviously, with smartphones, uh, growing of growing importance. Um, uh, people are consuming uh, on the run again, short attention spans, um, in in almost a uh, in a way they're not really paying attention the way they used to. We need to find out where they are. We need to know how to reach them in a contextually relevant way, mm -hmm. um, and in a way that that connects with them, not advertise to them, but connects with them where they are in a place when and how they want to consume. This is the big challenge. Mm -hmm. um, I didn't say that as articulately as I wanted to, but I think you get the point. Um, so segmentation, targeting um, is not possible without understanding who and where the customer is and where they're consuming media. And this is what we're, uh, as I say, more segmentation of messaging, more targeting messaging is the absolute key for 2019. So if, if you guys were to be a little, uh, to be like self-reflective of how you currently do this today, like how you tie the pieces together, right? I mean, there's digital media, there's traditional media, there's uh, this non-traditional media that we just brought up. Uh, do you think you'd do it as well as possible right now? And um, I would say we're on our way there. Um, I think things like, um, you know, one-to-one -one measurement is so easy in a lot of channels. Obviously, digital is, is pretty straightforward. But how do you connect that, to your point, Eric, before, to what they're seeing in terms of a location-based message um, mm -hmm. that might follow them to search for something and then go to your site or go to social media and try to learn about something in more detail? It's difficult for us still to figure out, other than, okay, all those things mattered in terms mm -hmm. of attribution yep. and what worked, versus, oh, it was that one thing. It was that one message that you saw. It was that one out of home, you know, out front billboard that you saw that really got you to think about this differently. I think the reality is you're right, that there's so much attention paid to so many things all the time that it's really difficult for us to pinpoint what, what exactly contributes to what piece of things. We used to, we used to measure success by the number of people, who, site visits. Mm -hmm. Come to Nissan USA, that's victory, and we'd hold up the number. That's no longer relevant, what we're finding is. Um, we need a deeper experience. Um, and I think people are seeking a deeper experience online, on our site specifically. Uh, we now measure success by what we call key buying actions. There's a number, uh, 12, different, uh, um, 12 different steps that if a customer takes beyond just a site visit, um, that we, we know more about them, um, we know what they're interested in, we know uh, um, how deep they are in the buying process. Um, and so that's, again, one of the ways that we're measuring more deeply now um, so are we doing it the best we can? No, but we're getting better and we're understanding what truly leads to um, the path to purchase. And I think we're also trying to decipher between um, signals of interest versus signals of intent. And we're doing the same thing that it sounds like Nissan is and looking at those high value activities and trying to figure out which of those are the most likely to be correlated with sales or at least for us, traffic, not even sales, because the dealership experience is a piece that um, we can't necessarily control. But I think for us, it's really, you know, what is something that's interesting? You know, they, an impression, a, a moment in time, somebody pays attention, they share something versus intent. Mm -hmm. And that's something where that's a little harder to, to capture that in terms of mm -hmm. the balance of those two things. And both are really important. Mm. And w I think you, you brought up attribution. You want to talk about attribution? Um, I would be lying if we say we're doing it perfectly. I think we're on our way. We know, like I mentioned before, basically unified attribution. We look at a whole host of different factors all together. Um, digital, much, much easier. We measure one-to-one. -one. Um, we are looking at last touch. We're trying to go deeper than that. We are working on a multi-marketing multi multi mix model. I hate that word, MMM. Um, and a few other things as well. So I think 2019 is a space for us to watch because we'll be more sophisticated in how we do things and how we connect them together. We're not doing it perfectly. Okay. Maybe Nissan is. Every Nissan. sale at Nissan comes through the marketing strategy and content yeah. person. So Con it's oh, really? Wow. Okay. Wow. Maybe that's what I need right. to do hey. differently. We Everything have a winner. needs to come through me. We have a winner. <laughs> we credit every sale to that guy. I love that. That's awesome. That's really cool. <laughs> So, um, well, let's talk about content, right? So own and earn media, right? Uh, typical, uh, big part of the, the customer journey, particularly with autos. Um, uh, so what role specifically do content as well as uh, social and UGC, uh, UGC, uh, user generated content, uh, play in amplification uh, specifically for, for you, Eric? Well, I, certainly cars is an easy industry for that, right? I mean, it's a passion industry. Um, I would argue Nissan actually uh, has an advantage in that way um, with the GTR, the Z, 
Um, we have extremely passionate uh, followings for that, for that sports car heritage that Nissan has. But at the same time, we've got the electric car, the Nissan Leaf, um, and we've got a huge, huge following among those that follow electric cars and, and, and those emerging technologies. So we've got that other end of the spectrum, quite frankly. So in the social space, um, we've had a bit of a leg up for, for um, quite a number of years in terms of uh, stoking passion, uh, sharing engagement, um, uh, endorsements among uh, stakeholders within those industries or within those fields. So it's, it's a little bit of a layup for us in the social space when we want to uh, stoke the fires a bit for our brand, um, whether it's through sports cars, whether it's through uh, emerging technologies and electric cars. Um, but influencers and influencer mm -hmm. marketing is, is a way that we're exploring um, to a greater degree than ever. Because again, we know that, that Nissan alone um, is probably not an engaging uh, way to, to reach millennials, to, to reach folks these days. They've got too many choices from a content standpoint. So if we can use influencers in the social space, if we can leverage UGC in the social space, um, how, can we, uh, how can we engage with our audience? How can we engage you know, specifically uh, Conquest and Kias, which is a big strategy for us? Um, <laughs> We've noticed it's okay. <laughs> yeah. um, no, Just but wait for next year. Uh, uh, again, <laughs> what's happening as next I year? As I said, how can we how, how can we leverage influencers uh, specifically in the social space? How can we um, use EGC from our own passionate owned um, influencers and stakeholders for our brand uh, internally? So, absolutely a big focus for us and a big opportunity. Um, so the, I, I think what, what I'm getting a lot of, and I get this a lot when I ask these questions about the customer journey in, in a lot of fields, um, it's hard. It's hard, right? It's not easy. <laughs> uh, attribution's hard. It's not easy. Um, so looking at 2019 what, uh, and beyond, uh, what, uh, what, where, do you find your, where do you find yourselves, find yourselves viewing the customer journey, what you do specifically, and uh, what gives you the greatest hope? Go to the next slide. Ah. Yeah. Oh, hey, we're, we next have slide. those slides. One oh, there slide. They are. No, back, back. She back. drew them for us. <laughs> I did. I, do you want to stand here? Do we have to stand there we go. and look at them? Yeah, we're kind of, oh, well, oh you can see yeah, them right I there. Yeah, I think too. you guys are really familiar there with this, go. right? This is your 5.8 seconds, that before. right? Okay, whatever, what's up there? But a better question, which I love asking people When was this model created? When was the purchase funnel Ooh, originally created? 1950s? No. Keep going back. Anybody? Keep going back. Nin the 1920s, too late. Back. Bingo. I think it was like 1892. What? Yes. Okay. So are we ready with a show of hands to move away from said purchase funnel, please? Oh. So there's my prediction for what I'm excited about well for 2019. So, but, but honestly, guys, we all know this is still how we plan for a lot of things that we do, including media. There's still that, you know, these guys, this is a good play for awareness, this is a good play for familiarity, et cetera, et cetera. Who drew that? I mean, originally, was it Nielsen? Just kidding. Um, it it was done for some farming thing, I think, a long time ago. I can't even remember. Anyway, so what I'm hopeful for and looking forward to is we actually plan launches. We plan, you know, sustainment in terms of core models and things like that throughout the year based on this, which again, we all know what this looks like. You've all seen different iterations of it multiple different times. This is ones that I just hand drew from different things that we have in the office. Um, you know, what's harder though is that you have a lot of touch points, a lot of different places to connect together, a lot of different attribution mm -hmm. um, questions that come up, right? If it's all of these things, how on earth do I figure out what actually works and what doesn't? And the reality is I think we're still in the infancy stage of figuring that out. Um, at least that's what I think. Um, and I think even if we just cover most of these bases with content, you know, that like you were saying before, Eric, that's relevant, that's contextually where people are at right now, whether it's a signal of interest or intent. And we have to, the reality is we have to know a lot more about you and we have to pay attention to that a lot more on a daily basis than we do now. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, if I look at, you know, Ross and saying, okay, where is, where are you in this journey and how do I follow you? How do I give you all these great messages? That's a really complicated thing. It's much easier to, do this. I get lots of Rosses and I get lots of Eric's and I get lots of all of you, right, to come through this and I buy huge groups of, you know, audiences and media and all the rest of it. It's all about exposure. And then eventually with this model, ergo, you will, uh, those of you who are interested will make your way down to the bottom of the funnel. 
<laughs> really? <laughs> I like the way you're I did, I, I know. I did ask this, this, um, these groups, this group of Gen Z uh, students a couple weeks ago. I said, so, you know, you guys know about the purchase funnel, right? Of course, they didn't know it was 1892 or whatever, but that was fun. Um, but I said, how many of you actually want to be in this funnel? I got zero hands. I'm like, what? We don't want to be talked about, you know, like that. We want this. You have to know me. You have to know exactly where I'm at. You have to know what I want. I expect the brand to do all the work and figure that out because literally in a moment of six seconds or less, it may be any of these things. It may be a combination of different things. Hey, so, when, Wendy, take a picture of that. <laughs> <laughs> it looks like chemistry a little bit. I know, it was a sketch last night. What can <laughs> I say? Great. My drawing I love, I love skills it. are not I, so I'm bueno. a very visual learner, I'm, I'm loving it. Um, <laughs> so anyway, it's not rocket science, but that would be something. I would love to see more media, more agencies, more folks think about where they fit into that journey when they pitch us ideas. So I think, I'm, I think I'm realizing finally how to phrase the questions that are in my head that I can't figure out how to phrase. Um, so the, the, the object of this panel for me was to um, talk about you know, the, the importance perhaps, in the future maybe, since it may not be here yet, of the sort of two-way communication, or three, triple, whatever. Look at all those media, like, well, you know? It, it, when, when all those media start connecting each other, as, right. as well as just yes. like, I mean, the consumer has the location that's a constant. And then you have all these media that like, what if they are communicating back to the consumer at all times and everything is communicating with each other and like, how do we get there? Well, and, then who, but, and that's a great question. Sorry, that's not exactly what I thought you said before. But, um, but it's a fabulous question. And I think some of the answer is that, who, my, or my question would be back to you, who does that? Well, I don't Who know. connects well, all I, that I, together? I, I mean, we I, connect our uh, websites and our art channels for sure. But I mean, in terms of connecting, well, I'm thinking all the Internet of Things, really, things. right? I mean, isn't that what we're thinking? I mean, isn't that what this question is? Is like the Internet of Things? What what does that bring to the table potentially? I mean, it's, I, I feel like people don't know that it's there yet, and people being marketers and, and advertisers don't know that it's there yet, maybe, or maybe is it not quite there yet? I mean, the, the potentiality of like this two-way communication between all I don't all think that's things. a word. Potentiality? True. Whatever, I like making up words. I, come <laughs> on, it's my show. Attention? 5.8 seconds, potentiality. <laughs> Someone look that up, please. Come on, you, okay, come on. you know what I'm talking about, though, at least, right? It's almost cocktail time. No, it's okay. It, totally. We'll ask people over cocktails. I mean, look how tired I am. I'm making What's up words. What's the potentiality words. of that? You know what I'm saying, though. I'm sorry. Anyway, um, no, but you know what I'm saying, though. It's like, it, it's an interesting question. I mean, we're, we're, we're at the beginning stages of, like, it being kind of there. And, and AI is super important, too, in, in how this all evolves. But once, I mean, the, like, you know, once the ecosystem is kind of, th like, thriving and everything's communicating with each other, the customer journey, we don't have to do this anymore. <laughs> maybe, right? Really? I mean, well, maybe not. Not like know. the funnel where we did it for a thousand I, years. Hey, you know, <laughs> all right. I don't think it's a, I'll just say, I don't think it's a linear customer journey anymore. I, I no. do think... Customers, every customer is somewhere on that spectrum. Totally. And when you sit, but, when you talk about location marketing, it's yeah. not are they on, you know, are, are they on Main Street downtown right now, passing a Chipotle? Uh, it could be, but it's also location. Where are they in the process? Are they at the awareness level? Are they at ready to purchase? Are they at advocacy? It's understanding where they are from a location there. It's truly important also in terms of serving relevant messages. Oh, one of these questions is really good, and it's just building off of what you just said. Um, I feel like kind of throwing this out, uh, uh, doing that. So, um, oh, this is where it is. Okay, so Eric, in, in, in 2018, Nissan kind of doubled down on this differentiating technology, right? Like the, the Nissan uh, Intelligent Mobility, right? Wait, wait, give me a second. Um, so we live in an age where the smart, smartphones, many smartphones, right, are more powerful than many laptops and PCs, maybe, maybe the technology inside cars even. Um, do you think, both of you, this is a question for both of you, but Eric gets to answer first. Um, do you think that uh, in the future technology will continue to be a differentiator for marketers? Or are we talking about it maybe more as a great equalizer in the future? I mean, and w w how does that like change everything if it does? I mean, that's kind of what I'm trying to get at is, is can technology become an equalizer to the point where we don't have to talk about it anymore? It's just, it's just there and something that we have access to. The data that we Nissan, need. you know, you know our new campaign. The most exciting technology you own is now in your driveway. That's that's right. really yeah. the kind of the mic drop moment. At least we think it's a, it's a pretty cool, uh, impactful way to think about our cars. Um, so we do think technology is a differentiator. Will will everybody uh, catch up or have um, and maybe already have the same technology? Yes, but safety. You know, everybody's got safety, but safety's been a differentiator right. for certain brands. Mm -hmm. Um, for years and years and years, we think there's an opportunity to be known as a uh, first mover and a leader in the space. Again, but technology is going to be pervasive, you know, across all the owners. We we know that.
but we do think there's an opportunity to differentiate ourselves uh, at certain price points. Mm -hmm. Technology available, you know, you don't have to spend, it's kind of like the electric, $90,000 Tesla, amazing vehicle. $30,000 electric leaf, pretty damn good vehicle as well. Um, so technology at price points that are accessible, technology that are appropriate uh, for, uh, again, different customers at different life stages. Mm -hmm. um, maybe the technology exists across all OEMs, but is it available um, and, and relevant uh, in the right vehicles at the right time for the right customer? So we do think um, everybody's gonna have it, but we do think we have an opportunity at Nissan to differentiate ourselves. Um, across different product lines with different customers that, that offer similar technologies as, say, Tesla. Hmm. I'm going to answer that more broadly just because okay. I think that technology is, is um, ubiquitous enough now. When, people, when you talk about it, people think of in-car as much as they do their, what's in their pocket, so to speak, or their wallet. Um, and I think that we're, we're going through a period of both of those things kind of coming together. What I think consumers are saying to us is we want it to be easier. We want yeah. it to be faster and more seamless and not such a hassle. <laughs> and I mean that in the broadest sense across this entire journey um, and all touch points, right? Nobody wants to work very hard for anything these days in terms of uh, a brand interaction. It should be simple. And I could not more wholeheartedly agree with that statement. Um, so technology will be part of that background hum that you'll see, I think, across multiple different places. I'd love to see more ideas come out of a, not just we can measure something, but then we can facilitate the next action that you want people to take. And we're, by the way, although we don't represent all these touch points as one, it might be you know, in cinema, it might be in programmatic, it might be anywhere, but we understand that whole entire journey. And here's where we think we can uniquely fit in. And then we can help you understand how to best um, play off of what we can do. In other words, so we look at a whole customer saying, you know, let's talk to Jane rather than talking to 50,000 Janes about 50,000 messages which aren't relevant to her. So I think technology will be that nice hum in the background all the time. It will make life a lot easier, hopefully, for people to learn about cars, to own a car, to enjoy a car, the whole thing. But I also think, to your point, Eric, that I think that it will be a differentiator for, for especially for young people who are starting to compare their car to their phone or other right. technologies that we have. It's just a big phone. That's what I was trying to tell these students. All right. Okay. So, and by the way, I asked them if anybody wanted to do automotive marketing. Guess how many hands I got? Zero. Ooh. Hurtful. Hurtful. Right. If you were with me, you'd say the same thing. I'm like, really? Job security. Jo yes, but but we need young people to to market to young people too. And so I said, okay. Well, I love it. I Come on. I know. Well, pretend this is a phone. And I said, well, this is like a cell phone on wheels. Are you with me? Are you with me? Anybody? Okay. Really? <laughs> Do you want an internship this summer? I mean, come on, someone raise their hand. <laughs> Not a one. I'm like, wow. So my last question for you, are we, are we done? Tanya's like, nah, yeah, you're done. All right, five, uh, in five More years. More cocktails, in, cocktails. In five years, all right, all right in five minutes. <laughs> in five point in, six in one minute or less. Okay, no, but is, is the customer journey longer or shorter in five years? Typical. Shorter. Typical one. Shorter. Yeah. Shorter. shorter for Hopefully. Sure. Has yep. to be. Thanks to technology? Consumers are going to demand it. Yeah. And operationally, I think that we'll That's get... going to be a differentiator. Yep. Operationally, yeah. is more is as important as the message is as important as all these pieces working together. So it has to operationally fit, to your point earlier. Yeah. Everybody's got to talk to each other. Well, that's all I have. <laughs> you guys have cocktails. any questions? For, uh, yeah, cocktails, right. <laughs> Todd, do you have a question? Well, anybody else have a question? How, how do we... Okay. How do we get these kids interested in marketing? I mean... Well, they're interested in marketing. It's just not automotive. Oh, okay. Hi, Les Harrison from Alfred Media. Thank you both for being on stage today. Um, my question is really non-automotive. Um, what non-automotive brand do you guys look up to, aspire to be like, and why? Fail. Fail. I aspire to be that brand that reaches him <laughs> while he's on a panel <laughs> talking about us. <laughs> you hear it and you know who they are. You know what, I'll take a it's, a, it's a very obscure example, but I love it, because um, it's representative, I think, of a lot of brands right now. It's a little furniture company, I think they're based in LA, called Joybird, um, that caught my eye in social media. I happened to be looking for a new pull-out couch, um, and the way that they managed the consumer journey was amazing. Super simplistic, they sent me, you know, talk about traditional and non-traditional working together, they sent me this nice little thing of swatches, they said if you want to customize it, it'll take this long, if you don't want to customize it, we'll have it for you in two days or less, you'll track it. They told me the whole story, so they show me it's Leo that's working on your this, it's Jennifer that's working on this, so I felt like I was deeply involved in my couch. 
I loved it. I mean, I, and, pretty and then it came, and these guys were really awesome. And then they sent me a little survey afterwards, and they sent me a little thank you card, handwritten by the one of the people that had worked on, you know, putting together this this couch. Did you write a glowing review? I did, of course. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you so you could have not, right? I, and they're not very. I mean, they're digital in the sense that they spoke to me, you know, digitally, and I found them digitally. But um, talk about great, you know, a great seamless customer experience that was perfect throughout. That's a Fender. Little I'm a I'm a guitar player, and I'll just tell you, Fender is an amazing. Uh, marketer, uh, really respect um, f from tier one, tier two to tier three, their CRM, um, everything about them, their, 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 their brand efforts, their retail efforts, um, the communications that I get, the 360 uh, when I'm in market versus after I purchase, um, it, it, it's just really impressive. Um, so Fender, if you are a guitar enthusiast, you know what I'm talking about. We've got a question back here. Rob at US Auto Parts, uh, question for Kimberly, I like your no BS approach. Stinger launch, highs and lows. What can you share in just a few moments? Um, oh. Highs in the sense that um, we were able to do so much more, I think, with um, getting in front of customers and, and almost every single channel, every single medium you could possibly imagine, just because that car lent itself to doing a lot of very visual things, I think a lot of very creative things. Um, experiential was amazing for us for as a high, because people get in that car, close your eyes, what do you think this car is? You would never guess it's a Kia. And that, to me, was perfect. So, And all of our touch points were kind of working together along that journey. Lowe's, um, we are struggling like everybody else is in terms of other OEMs um, with selling sedans. And so even though we have a great product, it's super fantastic, we love it, it's, it's in a category that's just not growing. And so you know, we have to step back and figure out how to sustain that car in a different way going forward. Is that true worldwide? Or I know US, it's been... Uh, no. In some markets, um, China, um, parts of Central America, parts of Europe, no. But um, it's definitely a big, huge, massive trend here. Okay. Okay. I think we might be done. <laughs> okay. All right. Hey, Kimberly Cocktails. and <laughs> yes, it's thank you guys, the Kimberly and um, I'm sorry. Thanks, thank you so much, you Absolutely. guys. It's time for cocktails. Do you know where we're going? Yes. Where are we going? We're going down the hall to the right. Okay. And uh, thank you guys. Thank you, Out Front. Uh, Out Front will be hosting the cocktail party, and uh, thank you guys for coming today. Hope you learned something, um, and we'll see you next time. Explain what? A cocktail is actually yeah, out the door, down the escalator, turn right, and it's the second door on your right. You'll see the sign. We'll be there. We're going there now. And we hope to see you at our New York show. <laughs>